Hi, welcome to today's lesson on atomic structure. Today I pose the question, what are three differences between the Rutherford model of the atom and the Bohr slash planetary model of the atom? Three differences is kind of tough to come up with. Um, number one, Whew. Um, Rutherford describes his atom as mostly empty space and Bohr decided to keep that idea. He uh, took his electrons and locked them into orbitals. So that's number one, they're in orbitals. Number two, those electrons seemingly rotate around the nucleus. And number three, Bohr actually spoke about some atomic behavior. He said that the um, electrons had a home in one of these energy levels or orbitals, but they could move around um, given proper energy. So he's talking a little bit of behavior, which I guess technically isn't part of the model, like the picture, but it is part of his theory of the atom. Meanwhile, Rutherford didn't describe the behavior of the atom at all. Um, his electrons were just kind of there by happenstance. He, it, Thompson proved that the electrons existed and Rutherford had, di he didn't disprove the existence of electrons. So he had to keep them. He just threw them in there. He didn't really know what he was doing. Bohr was way more um, intentional with his placement of electrons. Okay, so we're going to get into um, summarizing all of the models of the atom down into atomic structure. So we have these particles that are called subatomic particles, and they are smaller than an atom. In fact, they go inside of atoms, and the number of subatomic particles in an atom is going to define what element we're talking about, and then some of the properties of that element. So here we have a picture. We have a nucleus, um, just like Rutherford says, that contains protons. And um, that is also what Rutherford said, that it was positive. We have some neutrons in there. You can see that the neutrons kind of squeeze between the protons, and that's on purpose. The purpose of the neutrons is to keep the positive protons from repelling each other. Say that 10 times fast. And then we have Bohr's energy levels where the electrons live. So to summarize, we're going to go through this picture. Um, protons, they are positively charged. They have a mass of one atomic mass unit. They are found in the nucleus. And then the number of protons will tell you the specific atom that we're dealing with. That is called the atomic number, and we'll talk more about that later. But if you look at a periodic table, um, there are 118 elements because so far we have found that you can contain up to 118 elements in the nucleus of an atom. Um, and even that is a loose statement. Um, so if that atom, let's say, has three protons, it would be an atom of lithium. So the number of protons is going to determine the identity of the atom. Next up, we have neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They have no charge at all. They are roughly the same mass of a proton, but we say that they have a mass of one atomic mass unit. If you ask a physicist to measure it in kilograms, it's slightly different, but chemists say they're roughly the same. Those neutrons are also found in the nucleus, and like I said earlier, the neutrons kind of squeeze in between the protons and prevent them from repelling each other because positives don't like to hang out with other positives. Next, we have electrons. That is the final subatomic particle. Electrons are negatively charged. They have a mass roughly one two thousandth of an atomic mass unit, meaning it takes roughly 2,000 electrons to have the same mass as a proton. So really crazy tiny. Um, they're found outside the nucleus. What you call that is going to vary depending on which model of the atom you're specifically talking about. So you could call it an orbit, a cloud, an energy level, um, a shell. We have lots of names for it, but it all means the same thing. It all means outside the nucleus. Finally, the number of electrons is going to determine the behavior of atoms. And this is kind of what Bohr was getting at, where um, electrons can move around, they can make an atom light up, they can give us characteristic colors. He was kind of on the right track there. Uh, I mean, everything he said was correct, but 
he was on the right track of getting subatomic particles in its essence to describe behavior. So he was kind of like the first guy, at least that I know of, to describe how subatomic particles can control behavior of atoms. Um, so the number of electrons very greatly is going to determine whether an atom takes part in a chemical reaction, how aggressive that reaction is, all of that comes down to the electrons. Now, there are some special electrons, and those are the ones on the outside. We call them the valence electrons, um, and they live in the valence shell or the valence cloud or the valence energy level. The valence just means the last one. Um, those electrons are the ones that are the most important. And you'll see that as we go through this atomic unit. Um, the valence electrons are the ones that participate in bonding. So in water, when a hydrogen wants to bond to an oxygen to make water, like here, um, those valence electrons are the only things that are participating in that chemical bond. So the valence electrons are super important. Looking at the periodic table, you can get a lot of information about an atom or an element. So at usually the top, sometimes it's on the bottom, every periodic table is printed a little bit differently, but there will be some number that has a decimal point and some digits behind it, and that is going to be your atomic mass. Some people also call it the average atomic mass. The atomic mass represents the average mass of all isotopes of that particular element. I know that's a little crazy sounding right now. It's really just all of the versions of carbon that exist have their mass averaged. Um, this is because sometimes carbon comes out a tiny bit heavier or a tiny bit lighter. Um, so when we take the average of all of the carbons, we come up with the atomic mass. Scientists work really hard to make sure that that number is correct. Um, and I will talk more about that in the isotopes video. The Atomic mass rounded to a whole number will represent the mass number. So if I take the 12.011 and round that to 12, the closest whole number, then that is going to represent the mass number of the average carbon. That means that the average carbon will have six protons and six neutrons, totaling 12 things in the nucleus. On every periodic table, an element is going to be represented by a symbol, which is always going to start with a capital letter. Sometimes it's followed by a lowercase letter. The symbol of the element is unique. It tells you what element you're working with. Some periodic tables, you'll be lucky enough to have the name of the element as well, but most chemists, most chemists will take some time to memorize the elements, not all of them, usually the ones that they're working with or the ones that are pertinent to their particular field. Um, we do look them up from time to time. I will tell you that much, but um, the symbol is going to be unique per each element. Last up, we have the atomic number, which is the whole number that each element has on the periodic table. It represents the number of protons in an atom of that element, and each element has a unique atomic number. There are no doubles. Everybody has their own. There are 118 elements, each with their own atomic number, 1 through 118. Knowing the atomic number of an element can tell you what that element is. So I know that the element whose atomic number is 35 is bromine because I can read that from the periodic table. In any atom, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons, which is also the atomic number. This is true for atoms. It won't necessarily be true a little bit later when we talk about ions, but for now, as we're talking about atoms, know that the protons is going to equal the number of electrons. On the periodic table, all of our elements are listed in order by their atomic number. That's how we've organized the periodic table after plenty of trial and error. It runs from one hydrogen and then it runs across to helium at number two in the top right, and then it'll start over again. It's like reading a book from left to right and top to bottom. Now we know that electrons are found in the energy levels that surround the nucleus of an atom, but only a certain number of electrons can fit in each energy level. And the reason for this is because as the electrons try to get close to the nucleus because they are attracted to that nucleus, they also are going to repel each other. So this electron right here is going to prevent this electron from getting any closer uh, to the nucleus because it's it's blocking. They have a repulsive force between them. 
The same is true for the electrons in the second energy level. They're going to try really hard to get to the nucleus, but the entire first ring of electrons is going to block them from getting close. This is why a certain number of electrons can fit in each energy level. You can use the periodic table to kind of figure out what the electrons look like inside of an atom and how they're organized. Um, so the rows on the periodic table that go across are called periods. And if you look at potassium, for instance, fourth row, all the way on the left, potassium is in the fourth row or the fourth period. So its nucleus is going to be surrounded by four energy levels of electrons. In total, you would know that um, potassium at number 19 would have 19 electrons. And since it's in the fourth period, you know they're organized in four energy levels. All right, using this table, you should determine the number of protons, electrons, the atomic number, and the number of energy levels for lithium, Li, and iron, Fe. Those are the two that I'm going to give you in addition to the one for carbon. So just to remind you, carbon's atomic number is six. It is number six on the periodic table, meaning it has six protons and six electrons. Because carbon is in the second row of the periodic table, I know that those six electrons are organized in two energy levels, and its mass on my periodic table is 12.01. Your periodic table may have some more digits. If that's the case, that just means that mine is rounded a little bit to give me fewer significant figures. All right, so looking at these answers, lithium is number three on the periodic table, so its atomic number is three, the number of protons is three, and the number of electrons, all three. It is in the second period, or the second row of the periodic table, so its electrons are organized in two energy levels, and its mass is 6.941. Again, the mass is an average of all of the lithium atoms on Earth. And moving on to iron. Iron is number 26 on the periodic table. It's in the center block of the periodic table. Iron symbol is Fe because it comes from Latin. Um, the number of protons is 26. Same with electrons and its atomic number because we're talking about an atom of iron. It is in the fourth row of the periodic table, so its electrons are organized in four energy levels, and its mass is 55.85 or something close to that because you may have some more significant figures. That is all I have for you on atomic structure today. Please make sure to leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss tomorrow's lesson, and I'll see you there. Bye!